guys and welcome to part 2 of my watercolour 101 series. So to set up for your painting watercolours you'll need two glasses of water, one full dirty, one full clean. I put the dirty on the right hand side and the clean on the left as I'm left handed. And you also need a bit of kitchen towel to blot any water on. You also need your watercolour paper set up. You don't have to stretch it or tape it down for this uh, this piece here. So for your first watercolour, actual watercolour painting, you won't be painting anything as a, in an actual object. You don't first of all need to see what your colours will look like. This is a practice that will stay with you all the way through painting. Even now as, well not professional, but as an inter intermediate painter, I still watch out any new paints that I get. So I know how they look, how they behave, how much water they take to get working again and be wet and as well you can see how strong they are and how they flow. So what I like to do is if I have, if I buy pans, I don't often buy pans, I mostly buy tube and film my own. But what I often do if I get pans is I save the wrapping of them, the paper wrapping and I, and I glue it onto the paper just above the colour so that I know all the information on that packet as well, so I know the pigment information, the name, the catalogue number, the brand, everything about it. So if I need to order that paint again, I know what I'm buying, or what I'm looking for, rather than trying to guess a random colour on a colour chart. So I'm just unwrapping these all here, and they were actually quite a challenge to unwrap some of them. The plastic wrapping was stuck to the paper made it quite difficult to get into. So this is a watercolour palette I purchased on Jackson's. All uh, materials I use in this, including paint, you can find in the link below, uh, which, which is an affiliate link. And what that basically is, is you buy it through that link, I guess a little commission off of it, but you don't get charged any extra. If anything, I think first time purchasers from Jackson's actually get a discount for using an affiliate link. So you will get a discount for purchasing that. As you see, some of the pan the paint actually comes out of the pan. That is a thing with particularly with Windsor and Newton. Sometimes the the actual paint block comes out of the pan, which is fine. You can just steal that back down with just a little bit of gum arabic. So I'm just trimming down the wrappers now because I don't want the whole wrapper on the paper because it's quite large. So I've just snipped off the ends and tidied it up. Doing this really helps. Helps you understand how your paint works and how it flows and how it really works and how it's going to affect you working it within the future, as in if you need to pre-wet your pans before you use them, which is sometimes a common thing. Now you should lay out your paper and your palette exactly the same, in the same order. So if red is first on your palette, which is like I have, then it should be first on the paper. That way you know you can match them up with which order is which. Because if you notice from the pans, it's not too bad when you've got a little 12 set, but when you've got a large set, say 24 or more, can be difficult to tell between the colours as some of the colours are quite similar dried in the pan as in a lot of the greens and earth colours can look similar or as well yellows I believe both yellows are quite similar the pale yellow and the cadmium yellow so I'm just sticking that down with a little bit of glue stick now two of these colours I don't have wrappers for because I purchased tubes and replaced colours that were already in this set I removed the black and white watercolour as I recommend you do and replace them with two different ones. The different ones are your choice. I chose cadmium red and cadmium yellow by the best. So I'm just drawing a little chart, little chart here to paint all my swatches in. This is very helpful to do to organise every, everything. It's really plenty of room for all your paint swatches. So you can have a concentrated part and a diluted part, which would be like a wash. 
And in this video I can't draw lines. <laughs> what I'm doing here is I am putting a black line down each of the squares so I can test how opaque the colours are. I recommend you do this as well. I'm using a fine liner, but you can use a biro pen as they are waterproof as well. You must make sure you use a waterproof pen so it doesn't bleed into your watercolour. And let it dry for five minutes as well after you draw it. Now as well you'll need a circular object to draw around because we are also going to paint out a colour wheel using some primary colours and this is very good because it gives you an idea of what mixes you can get with the colours and sometimes you can get really interesting mixes at, that you prefer to actual hand paints that are already pre-mixed. So what you do is draw a circle, divide that into four, then divide each quarter into three as I'm doing here. Be too neat or too, they don't all have to be too all the same size, but similar size helps. So let's get started. Just using a regular round brush here to swatch out my colours as normal. That's, I'm doing this straight from the pan. You don't need too much water, but at the same time, you need to make sure you have enough. So you paint out the most intense, concentrated part at the top you can get. Make sure it is the most concentrated and intense you can get it. So very little water. Then rinse your brush in the dirty water pot and reload it with clean water from the clean water pot and drag the paint down. Okay, what this does is it makes the paint see how well the paint flows and that the paint should flow into the water creating a gradient wash. If it doesn't flow too well, because like these are student grade paints, so don't flow as well as artist grade. You may have to play with the concentrated part a little bit as well. Try and get it as smooth gradient as possible. Which is why it's important to get that black line vertical so you can see if it's opaque when it's thick or transparent when it's thin. A tip for that is if you have an opaque watercolour, it will always you can always make it transparent. Just make it really thin and that will make it transparent. All of these paints are pretty transparent. I think there's one or two that are semi opaque. I mean, just they're not very strong as these as they are student grade paint. Now, out of this, these paints, they're all okay paints. I wouldn't something bad I can say about them, but there's nothing amazingly brilliant that I can point out about them apart from a few colours. The ones that really stood out to me were the turquoise. And I think it was the Theoxidine Purple and the Viridian Green that really sort of stood out. The Ultramarine Blue isn't pretty poor Ultramarine Blue compared to others that I have used. The Alizarin Crimson is pretty nice actually, I do quite like that. The Burnt Sienna is a bit of a light Burnt Sienna I feel. This set does include a standard set of mixing colours and this is a set that I would recommend the set I have here for your basic palette with what you would paint sort of gem in general, so general painting palette. So you can paint a few botanicals, landscapes, portraits, um, art, pop art sort of things like anime, you can paint most things with this palette. You can see from this, the only colours that are really sort of opaque are that purple, which is semi-opaque. It's quite a dark purple, quite, it's very easy to get a concentrated colour. Same with the Payne's Grey, it's quite a dark colour, so it does look semi-opaque. So on to the colour wheel. So first, painting your primaries. In between each primary, you should have you should have three triangles between each primary. These will be for your secondary and tertiary colours. So this is the primary blue I'm using, which is ultramarine blue. Then I leave three spaces and paint the cadmium yellow. 
I leave free spaces again and paint the cadmium red at the top. Just every fourth triangle is the triangle you paint in. So next on to the secondary colours. These tend to be an equal mix of both the primaries that you use for it. So first we're doing purple. And it's very hard to get a decent purple for mixing cadmium red and ultramarine blue. To get a decent mix of purple you need to have a cool red, which we will go through uh, a little bit later on. So that's the purple. The next step is the green. Now one thing that can happen with mixing ultramarine with other colours and other granulating paint is you can have some very interesting effects happen with them as the paint mix can sometimes separate and create a very interesting beautiful effect if that's the effect you're going for. However if you want a smooth gradient then ultramarine would not be a good one to mix with. So that's the orange going in there. It's a bit of a weak orange actually. Now this is a blue a blue purple so it's on the, it's purple but it's on the blue side and it has more blue in it than red now i suggest you paint these colors in as i'm painting them there are, is a reason why for example the purple is you use less blue paint making the current purple blue purple now you would try to get a red purple back to blue purple if that makes sense so by doing this you will use less paint and waste less paint so here is the yellow green. Remember to paint it in the right triangle. Now with the blue green, which I did I do quite like this blue green with the ultramarine mix actually. As you can see these being student grade paint, the paints don't really pop up the page too much compared to my artist grade, which I noticed. But if you've never worked with artist grade paint before, you won't notice that so much. They are definitely better than if you, you ever use Crayolas. So that's the colour wheel finished. Now we're going to paint a few other mixtures that would be helpful, such as we're going to use different colours to paint the same mix if you understand. So I'm using a alizarin crimson and the ultramarine blue to make a purple. It's, as you can see it's a much better purple. That's because the red is a cooler red rather than warm. So you'll get a better purple. Cool red, warm blue, you get nice purple. Uh, warm yellow, warm red, you get a nice orange. A cool blue, and a cool yellow make a nice green. It's the best way to make those mixes. If you do it the other way around, if you have like a like we did on the colour wheel or a warm red and a cool blue, warm blue even, they look a bit you can still get a purple but it's not as nice a purple. And this is a green now done with the turquoise blue. As you can see it's a really nice bright green. Not too many shades off a viridian green. Sort of a mix between a viridian green and a sad green. We're also going to make a skin tone swatch. The basic way to make a skin tone colour is to use a yellow ochre and mix a little bit of a cool red into it, such as the alizarin and crimson, which is what I did. And then add plenty of water to it to really tone the colour down, otherwise it will be too bright. Unless you are painting somebody with a skin colour from Essex. If that's the case, you want it nice and bright orange. So this is coming to the end now of our part two of my watercolor series. Please stay tuned for the next episode where we will be doing our first natural painting. So thank you very much for joining me. Please check out all the links in the description for any additional info. Thank you very much. Until next time. Goodbye.